Uh, welcome to this virtual summit, Julie, and thank you so much for joining me today. We're going to talk about the work you've been doing over the last 10 years, I think. Um, and I'm fascinated because in some ways it's, it's a very different conversation I think we'll have today than I've had with most of the other people as part of the summit because they've taken what you might think of as the more traditional route of social impact being volunteer work or, or, or social enterprise, but you've taken a, a much more commercial direction, it seems to me. And I wonder if perhaps you can just perhaps tell us who you are first of all, let's get you onto the call and then let's explore the work you're doing and, and why you're doing it the way you've done it. Sure. So I describe myself as a community engagement strategist um, and within that I do business mentoring. Um, but the thing I'm most known for is running a coaching business called Too Fat to Run, which is actually a plus size fitness business. Mm. Um, but my background is very, very varied. I actually started um, my working career as a drama practitioner and facilitator and did lots of stuff with kind of communities around how do we get people engaged with what was going on locally. So, you know, I'm relatively new to official coaching. Mm. Um, training with Animas was a real kind of eye opener to me that I'd been coaching my whole life, just didn't know it. Um, and it was brilliant to, to really upskill myself to have proper coaching skills rather than the rough around the edges ones that came naturally to me. Mm -hmm. um, so it was brilliant, but I realized quite early on in that process that I was definitely more of a mentor than a, than a traditional straight coach. Mm. Um, but I think a lot of what I've done over the last 25 years has been about bringing people together and helping people to feel less alone and more connected to their environment. And, it may to other people feel really disjointed all of the different things I've done in my life. But to me, they're one and the same thing. I spot a problem. I realize that people feel disconnected and I find creative solutions to bring people together. Mm -hmm. And so n that's never changed really. I'm still spotting, you know, issues and problems and still finding solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I talk, talk a lot about community and a lot about tribe, which is obviously a bit of a kind of um, a buzzword. Everyone wants to have an online tribe but I use a lot of the things that I learn in real community engagement on the ground. Yeah. How do you act, how do you get hard to reach people to engage? And actually everyone online now is hard to reach because there are so many people trying yeah. to reach them. So a lot of those principles are very similar from offline um, to online. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's perhaps what is quite unique about my approach to business coaching. Okay, interesting. Now, when, when, uh, there's so much I want to explore in there, but I just want to set the context for this being social impact. So, sure. When when you shared your work, it seems clear to me that there was there's a bigger vision for what you're trying to achieve than just yeah. a successful practice. Now, I, I wonder if you could share what that is for you. Sure. So, I set up a blog um, ten years ago. It's the ten year anniversary on Saturday. I went for a run. I did a ten k race locally and came last and when I got to the finish line the finish line had been packed up and everybody had gone home and so at the time I mean I can laugh about it now but at the time I was mortified I was right. so embarrassed I was angry I was furious I would paid my money just like everybody else and nobody would wait mm. and that I mean, st still it makes me feel quite emotional um, and I can remember cycling home furious and then seeing the funny side and then thinking god I should start writing about this because it is quite funny and so that afternoon I set up a blog called the fat does guide to running I never thought it would become popular it was just a hobby it was just a bit of fun um, and I had a job at the time as an Olympic development manager so I was doing community engagement connected to the games never thought the blog would be monetized or anything like that it was more about it was a passion project it was just something fun to keep me motivated mm. while I trained for my first marathon but it got a lot of traction, a lot of organic traction really quickly because 10 years ago, nobody was speaking about plus size. It wasn't really a thing other than clothing. Um, so we didn't have the This Girl Can campaign. We didn't have um, plus size models. You know, it was a very different landscape. And so what happened were people, people were saying to me, oh my God, for the first time ever, I feel like I'm not alone. Um, and so that was very much um, a community and a blog, but it was definitely not a business. And then what happened was I got made redundant from my job on the games and had a baby and all of a sudden found myself unemployed, about to lose my home and thinking, what, what can I now do with a new baby? You know, I can't do contracting like I used to. I can't work as a consultant. It's too difficult. And so I thought, well, look, there is this need. Um, and I think I could bring this community together and 
create something that wasn't necessarily about profit, but that gave me enough to live on. Mm. And so the business was very much a socially driven uh, business that was about changing the world, you know, and I say that unapologetically. Mm. Um, and I didn't know if it would just be for a couple of years while I got myself sorted, to be fair. And I thought maybe it would turn into a social enterprise at some point, but it was based on micro payments. So, you know, I, years ago, I wasn't selling anything more than £25 programs, you know, but I was selling them en masse. So, yeah. you know, it was kind of buy a t shirt, buy an ebook, and buy a coaching program, you know, and group. Pro- group coaching online wasn't so much of a thing you know seven wow. seven eight years ago so it was quite unique particularly for the fitness world I think whereas now it's commonplace to kind of do a, an online fitness program with people um but it was I don't know when I when I turned it from a blog into a business I did have some selfish objectives which was to not be poor anymore <laughs> you yeah. know here I was single mum and it had to it had to make me enough money to live on to cover my bills and so that helped me with the vision it had to be big it had to be global it had to be um as impactful as it was kind of income generating and I think I'm really lucky that I was made redundant and it did collide with me becoming a mum because I don't think I would have had the courage to yeah. do it otherwise because I still look back and go, God, did I really have the balls to do that? Because it was quite big in its vision. Mm. Um, and, and my mission right from day one was, what if we could get a million overweight women running and feeling better about themselves? Um, and at the time I had about 300 followers. So right. it was, you know, it was a very lofty goal. Yeah. And did you set specific timeframes for that sort of thing? Or was it more just a, a vision that you kind of just put out there? It was a vision. It was a vision. Mm. I had no idea how long it would take. Um, and there were there were moments where I thought this is it this is the moment it's going to go massive and then it didn't you know so I did six weeks on ITVs this morning and I was like yes this is going to be the moment and then it was great it was a great experience and it did drive traffic but it didn't really make a big difference to the business Mm. Um, and then I did something with Richard Branson and I got into this competition I got down to the last 10 and I thought this will be the bit Mm. and none of it really made that much of a difference I mean it's like a it's a drip 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 you know um, and I never really had the resources to grow the business in the way that I wanted to. I didn't have the capacity um, because I was still struggling, still finding my feet as a single mum. So mm. I think I would definitely have done things differently if, if I wasn't in the situation that I was in. Um, but it's been an incredible journey of self-discovery, really. Mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's really great to hear. So you, you had this business and it was 10 years ago, right? Is that, is that yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah. So 10 years on, if I may ask this, where, where are you now with it in terms of the impact you've made? Do you, cause one of the, let, me ask, let me ask it this way. One of the things I'm always curious about, Julie, is when people say, I want to impact the lives of a million people or, or whatever. And you think, how do you know? So I'm curious, how, how did you kind of get that sense of what's the impact you're making? It's so hard. And, and the thing is, because I've worked um, uh, with kind of government money where they get you to track right i'm really aware that i have done no official tracking right i i know that so um i did a project last year uh, in barking and dagenham which is one of the poorest boroughs in the country and that was robustly evidence-based research to look at the impact and we um worked with a thousand women uh, mm. over the course of a year and and i had to do that for my own peace of mind so that I could say this actually does work I'm not just Mm. making up the numbers um I think I can do stuff around you know how many people have bought a program from me how many people I have in my communities um I mean I still don't know my estimate is that I've worked with 15,000 women but that I could be underestimating Mm. that I could be overestimating um I I would say my books would say that there's at least 15,000 women that have been through one of my online programs um but a lot of the impact is not measurable because of the women that I serve because I call I call my brand a bit of a tenor lady brand right and what I mean by that is the tenor lady which is a women's product women don't go around screaming and shouting about it because they're a little bit embarrassed that they need it but it's still a product that they love Mm. and my brand is a bit like that women love it they're massive believers in the brand but even their husbands don't know that they do programs even their kids don't they won't talk about it on their social Mm. media channels and not everyone is like that it's kind of half and half split there were those that are loud and proud and those that are a little bit embarrassed still Mm. um and so it is hard to track the impact um i know that more than 10 million it's it's going to be more than that but 
I know that more than 10 million people have looked at my blog. Wow. You know, so, um, you know, I've been featured in about 50 different countries on different media channels. Oh. So I'm really bad at maths and I should probably sit down and try and work it out. But to be fair, it doesn't matter that much, the numbers mm. to me. It's more the feeling of the impact um, mm. and also the ripple effect. I know that women are raising their girls in a slightly different way because of the work that I've done with them. And that feels super cool, you mm. know? Yeah. Wow. Could you, could you describe the journey you took to get to 10 million views, you said, on your... That's, yeah. that's incredible. Just share the journey. That, that, uh, ha, and, and you've had all this publicity. How did you kind of keep spreading the word, especially yeah. in, in, in a, as you say, like a piece of work that is not naturally advocated in a big way yeah. by, by the customers? Yeah. I mean, I would consider myself now a branding and PR expert, but back then I absolutely wasn't. I was so wet around the ears and I used to do like real kind of guerrilla marketing. I would tag people into my stuff and I can remember there was this story that hit the newspaper about Katie Hopkins. She was doing this weight loss thing and I was so frustrated with being tagged into things going, what do you think about this? Because, you know, she was doing this horrible thing. And so I started a campaign which was hashtag jog on Katie Hopkins <laughs> and it, it, it absolutely got traction and the Daily Mail phoned me up and said, can we do an article? Because, I'm, you know, they were really happy that I was taking her, you know, and, and arguing against her. And they did. They did a two page spread, you know, plus size blogger takes Katie Hopkins to town, mm. you know, and that drove lots of traffic. And so I always think about branding, particularly because I'm quite working class and quite normal and quite down to earth I always think like what would the Daily Mail he headline be or what would they say about me in the sun and yeah. I, I ham that up a little bit um, so the word fat is very provocative and I use it for that reason it's helped mm. drive traffic to my website and it's one of those does what it says on the tin brand so people go oh I'm fat that must be for me and Believe it or not, a lot of fat women are not actually turned off by that word. Mm. You know, I was a little bit afraid of it in the early days. I thought, oh, God, I'm going to really upset people. But it's about tone and it's about what I stand yeah. for. So I think being provocative in your marketing, mm. um, not being afraid to be different. I mean, I've had um, quite a few falling outs with major brands who have said really horrid things or have done things that are not size inclusive. And I will talk about it i will say why does this x brand not represent the people that buy their trainers so we we can buy your trainers that are 100 pounds but i can't buy a, a pair of leggings or a top because you only go up to a large mm. so you know th there's certain things that i've done strategically where i've been really wound up and i'm like right actually if i have a bit of a row with them that'd be mm. great publicity um and i think it's when you have um a mission and the mission is bigger than you sometimes you do things that are slightly outside of your comfort zone yeah. in a way that you wouldn't if it was just for you mm. yeah yeah that makes sense there's a couple of things i want to pick up on there if i may and one is kind of tactical and one is it, it relates to the sort of more philosophical position you've just said but i'd like to go to the tactical one which is the pr thing i've always found pr like i've just never engaged in pr and i'm curious are you actively doing pr or is it more that you get picked up because of the way you message yourself yeah i very rarely do anything uh, proactively mm. so sometimes i'll spot an opportunity but often people spot my stuff so mm. um i particularly on twitter in the early days twitter used to be really good for me um and i would use there's a hashtag you can use called pr request mm. and every now and again i would just put that hashtag on a story and different journalists would pick up on it i think that's probably the most proactive thing i've ever done okay but but i don't send out press releases i don't have a pr agency i don't have any of that stuff and mm. when i look at all of the media companies i've worked with and all the brands it you might think oh she must have a pr company behind her and, and mm. i don't um, and so I think it is about having something that's newsworthy. So many business owners want to get in the press, but they don't do anything interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and I, I think even if you're not in the fitness world, you know, I've run six marathons, I've done triathlons. Those are newsworthy for somebody of my size to be doing those things. People stop. Like, so when I run the New York marathon, the company got in contact with me, the New York marathon and said, can you be like our poster girl? Will you know? Will you feature in our magazine? And I was like, mm. of course. And so by the time I went out to New York, I had loads of other um, media agencies saying, you know, while you're in town, will you come and visit us? We'll do a photo shoot and an interview. And so it's this snowballing effect 
but you've got to do something worthy of news. That's fascinating. I'm, I'm curious by that because I feel like, uh, like if I'm going to be really, really honest, I feel like if I were to do something interesting, I still wouldn't be picked up. And I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just wondering. About, yeah, it's all on. about the extremes though. It's all right. about the extremes and allowing yourself to be vulnerable. Uh -huh. um, you know, like there's nothing more vulnerable than having a full page body size of you and your lycra mm. with your wobbly bits in the sun. You know, I can remember my uncle phoning up going, Oi, do I see you in the sun. Do you know what I mean? And that is vulnerable to have like yeah. your immediate family see you in the newspaper that they see on the building site. Like, yeah. you know, there are so many layers of shame and embarrassment we have about being ourselves. And so mm. when you're fearlessly yourself and you don't care what other people think, it helps you to get closer to the goals that you set for yourself. Mm. Yeah, 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 interesting. So that links in a way to the more philosophical question, which was, you talk about when you've got something that's bigger than yourself, you will put yourself in uncomfortable positions. And I, I, you might not be able to answer this as such, but I'm curious on your take on it, which is a lot of people don't know how to quite find, like they have a sense of what's important to them. They don't know quite how to kind of nail their flag to the mast. And I wonder whether you can share your perspective around how somebody can really find what, 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 what drives them forward. Yeah, I think, um... I think it's about trusting your instincts and being open and curious. So when I was at school, I wasn't particularly good at anything. I wasn't very academic. I was really bright, but I was quite naughty and I had lots of stuff going on at home. And so I didn't really excel at school, but I loved drama. And I think the reason I loved drama was I was able to express myself um, and I could have fun and it wasn't all serious. And so when it comes to choosing what I was gonna do next, it became a no brainer. I didn't have a desire to be an actor. Um, I didn't really think too far ahead. I was like, what do I enjoy doing? Let me go and explore that. Um, and I've made all of my decisions in life based on that sounds interesting. Mm. Let me go and explore it without going, oh, but if I do that, that takes me away from my path. Mm. My path was always, I can remember when I was young and people say, you know, what do you want to be when you're older? My answer was, I don't want to be poor. Like seriously, I, did, I, I come from such a working class family, we were really quite poor and I just wanted to have choices. I wanted to be able to, you know, when the deodorant can emptied, I wanted to be able to go and buy a new one without having to beg my mum for the money or, you know, find other ways to go and get it. And so I was very driven from a very young age to be able to be self-sufficient. Mm. And so it didn't really matter what I ended up doing because I knew whatever it was, I'd find enjoyment in it. Um, and so even now, I don't know whether in five years time I'll be doing the same things I'm doing now. Mm. So it's not really about having a life plan as such and, and being super, super strategic. It's more about seeing opportunities and just staying in alignment over what you're good at, what you enjoy. And one of the things that's really happened in the last six to eight months, which has coincided with COVID, you know, I don't know if that was on purpose or not, but I've really got back in contact with my creative side. You know, mm. I started as an act, you know, doing acting and drama and, and kind of dance and stuff like that, poetry. Um, and I showed a video, didn't you, of me, me doing oh, my, fabulous. I loved it. you know, my, uh, what some people call rap. Um, <laughs> and that I reconnected with my ability to see things creatively. Mm. And me being a creative person is a massive part of who I am. And yet when mm. I first become a business coach, I was like, no, I've got to be professional. I've got to be serious. I've got to talk properly. And I've got, and actually my creativity is a breath of fresh air to my clients. Like, you know, I, I opened up the doors to a program a couple of months ago. And as part of the opening session, I danced to Britney Spears dressed as a circus master, you know, <laughs> with the full costume. And yeah. they were not expecting that. You know, and the message within that was to find who you are. That's how you build a tribe. You know, you really look deeply into who you are and you give people 100% of that rather than the 50% that feels comfortable. Mm. Um, and so I think everything, every decision I make in life is based on curiosity. And to some extent, does it feel good? Does it feel right? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Because I think it seems to me a lot of people do things that... Um, they think is what they should be doing. I mean, it's interesting, you even said, the one thing I knew is I didn't want to be poor. And of course, in classic coaching terms, they say, no, that's a negative goal. You can't have a negative goal, you gotta have a, a positive. And you're like, well, I don't know what I want. I just yeah. know what I don't want. And it sounds to me like there's something about being true to yourself that feels very important to enjoying the climb to wherever you're going. Yeah, yeah. And so for me, it's like, I do struggle a little bit with this. Um, you know, I, I 
have a tendency to either live in the past or to be striving towards the future, right? Mm. That's my go-to behavior pattern. And actually training as a, a life coach, learning a little bit more about certain techniques to overcome that have really helped me to live in the present. So to, to say, right, you know, I can remember as a kid, we'd go, you know, what would you do if you were a millionaire? You know, we'd sit there with the Argos catalog and pick all the things <laughs> we'd buy, right? Yeah. And so that was always about the future. You know, and then you, you turn around and all of a sudden you're kind of middle-aged and you're still thinking about the future and when you might become a millionaire, when actually we can choose to live an abundant life now. So, you know, if our idea of the future is about freedom or happiness or beauty or whatever the things are, those values, what if we had that every day now? What if we made choices, you know, and, and they don't have to be massive choices. You can make really small uh, upgrades in your life like a nice candle can make you connect to the idea of beauty uh, uh, you know freshly baked cake a walk in nature and it sounds a little bit try it but actually when you can connect to the energy that you want and the feeling you want it becomes easier to get closer to the big thing you want yeah. uh, because then it doesn't feel so alien like you know you hear about these people that win the lottery and they lose it all because it's so uncomfortable for them to be around wealth you know, and I don't know whether what will happen with my businesses in terms of how much money they make, but I will know I'll, I will always feel abundant and wealthy because I've mm. found that in me, regardless of my environment. Yeah, yeah, it sounds to me like there's something very important about because we, we often have got the idea of like arriving versus the journey, and of course, the journey is kind of where it all happens. So it sounds like, you know, in a sense, what you're saying is you've got to enjoy the journey if you're not enjoying it. Absolutely, the... yeah, and you know, when I was, um, when I was about 15 or 16 my drama teacher said oh there's this director come into town who's really really quite famous and he's doing a community project called we all come from somewhere else and he's looking for an associate director and so me and my friend during our easter holiday went and worked with this guy and it was a, a community thing kids from six or seven different schools all coming together talking about the journey of their parents to arrive in newham which is so diverse and i always think back to the messages in that play which was all about the journey Journey. and we never just arrive somewhere there's always a backstory um, there's always things to be grateful for um, hardship brings with it gifts you know and, and I was probably a little bit too young to fully understand it but I always think back to it now you had a sense of it yeah yeah so let's let's then come back to the, the the social impact side of your business and I'm curious how you because obviously it's a commercial thing for you as well and I'm curious how you balance the commercial imperative with the social impact imperative and you've kind of described it but i'm curious like where are you now 10 years on how are you managing yeah. those two different elements it's really difficult it's really really difficult because um in an ideal world i would turn two fat to run into a social enterprise right and and last year i explored doing it we were going to get some funding from a big funder mm. and they pulled out at the last moment i'd changed my whole business model because it was so apparent that we were going to get this money i changed my whole business model and then it didn't happen mm. and so it's really frustrating when you know your your um the way you work really has an impact on people but you're stunted in the growth because there's only one of you mm. and so i've always had to weigh up my own needs and the needs of my daughter against the needs of my community it's really it's a really difficult balance mm. and so i still have ambitions for that to happen i still think there's probably a different business model for right. that business whether that is and if you think about what's happening with covid and the government's view on obesity right now i think probably over the next six months i'll be having some quite interesting conversations with funders um, funders can't fund me because I'm a commercial business, mm. but actually all pretty much now, all of the money that comes in by two factor run goes back into the business because I make most of my living or I make all of my living now as a business coach. And, and so the value that I have in, in the two factor run business is in the IP, my processes and in the community, you know, and actually that it may be that a brand comes along and says, actually, we see value in that let's work together we will fund it because ideally what i'd love to see is you know so far it's been 95 percent online we do a, some meetups but not a lot mm. my ideal business model would be to train up two factor run coaches all over the country so coaches that can absolutely help people to run but also know the mindset 
stuff as well the mindset piece because yeah. actually i would say it's 50 50 i teach people to run with like how do you run but i also help them with overwhelm self-limiting beliefs uh, you know procrastination all of that kind of sabotage and and it's 50 50 and if you go to a running club a traditional one they don't talk about any of that stuff no. they just tell you how to breathe and what to do with your legs you know and so i really feel that there's a business case for having somewhere locally in every town and city where a plus size woman can go, oh, there's one down the road. I'll check that out. Mm. Um, and I think that's commercially vi viable and socially viable. I think it's, you know, but I just haven't cracked the business model bit of it. And that's partly capacity, trying to do two things at once. Right. One that makes me money, the other that doesn't, you know, you know since COVID, I actually created um, a free program during covid called thrive inside so people mm. were getting free coaching in that community mm. so for eight months i wasn't really making any money in the two factor run business at all right um and it felt good to be able to do that it felt like payback they'd helped mm. me for many many years and it just felt like the right thing to do at the time mm. um whether that's sustainable moving forward i don't know yeah yeah it, it's an interesting question for me as well because yesterday i was interviewing somebody for the social impact role i'm currently recruiting for and they're asking like what's the future of it in terms of funding and, and i said well actually it's interesting you say because right now the only funding is is hiring someone and then having them spend their time leveraging the community and i don't I, you know I, I have a very entrepreneurial approach to this which is what can you do with your own resources yeah but then she was saying to me, well, if you turn it into a social enterprise, you could do an awful lot more with it. And I was like, mm, I haven't thought of that. So I, I'm, I'm curious on your take on this, that by owning it as a commercial enterprise, you maintain control. You know, yeah. you're completely in control, but it limits your growth. And at the same yeah. time, if you were to start having funding, you've suddenly got to balance the needs of multiple stakeholders and so on. Yeah. What's your, what's your sort of, because it seems to me that having a commercial approach to this puts puts you far more control and, and anyone watching this might go oh, okay so i could actually make a social impact without all this yeah. funding nonsense so yeah. what, what's your thoughts god i've got such mixed views on this but, but i'm a real maverick so every job i've ever been in i've stretched the rules broken the rules you know done things my own way and got brilliant results um but being an entrepreneur, oh my God, you can take that to any level. Like mm. I can come up with an idea for a program on Monday and by Friday be selling it. Yeah. And that speed, that, that speed to market is brilliant. Mm. When you work for a local authority or a charity and to some extent for somebody else, you're always working to other people's timelines. You're always working to other people's budgets. You are accountable. And so that, that stops, it stunts creativity, um, entrepreneurship it just stops so much in its tracks mm. everything has to be measured everything has to be announced everything has to be done properly um, and having worked in the public sector and in the charity sector I'm not sure in my lifetime I'm particularly I wasn't willing to put the brakes on what could have happened with Two Fat to Run mm. you know it's, it's almost like a sliding doors thing I always wish I could do three versions of it and see which one <laughs> got there first, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, but you've got to do what feels right. Um, and interestingly, when we were negotiating over this big pot of money, something in my gut felt wrong. Mm. Something I didn't send off. I'd got all of these um, trustees. I'd got all of their signatures. I had, um, I'd written the check to send off to change the company status something made me stop i thought right i'm just going to give it four days out because i just didn't there was something about it that didn't feel right and then we got an email that said the board of directors didn't like it and really really sorry and you know that was eight months worth of changing the business model being told over and over again this is a no-brainer it's going to go through the board with no problems it's exactly what we need and that was oh my god it was just just you know and it makes you want to throw your toys out of the pram and go, I give up. I don't want to do it anymore because often you're relying on the goodwill of other people to put in time to help, you know, no. the trustees that I'd found somebody that was helping me with the fundraising bid, they were all doing that off their own time and money. Um, and I feel guilty because it's my vision, you know? Um, and so I'm in a much better place to make those decisions now without it affecting my livelihood. Yeah. Um, and so I do feel like, with the 10 year anniversary, I'm writing a book at the moment called Leading from the Back. I think that will generate quite a bit of in, uh, income and interest from various parties. And then I will look at what's the next 10 years look like. Mm. And for me, it will be about that model of licensing it or growing it. Um, we've just uh, put in a funding bid to do some work in South End, 
Um, the, uh, the government there have said, look, we've got money to get inactive people active. We're really interested in the kind of hybrid of some in person, some online. Um, so the model there is that um, a charity is going to buy my IP to mm. be able to use it and I'll have some creative control and, and go in and do some facilitation for them. But I think that model could be replicated around the country too. So there's lots of options. Um, and now that my daughter's back at school, I've got a bit of headspace <laughs> to yeah. think about them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, that's, that's interesting as, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, well, it's in a way you're developing a model that can be applied to many, many other areas of social impact. You, know, you just happen yeah. to concentrate on this one, but I wonder, yeah. I wonder to what extent you've, you feel in a position to start helping other people to achieve something like you've done, but in a different field. I mean, that's what I do in my business coaching. So okay. um, a lot of, I run a program called Tribe Builder, which does exactly that. It helps right. people to take their idea, the thing that they're passionate about and to exponentially grow it so that it has huge impact. And for me, it's mm. always income and impact. You can have right. both. Um, so there's a lady that I've been coaching for the last two years. She was a walking coach. And over the last two years, I've helped her develop something called a mil the Million Women Walking Campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and she now has a Facebook group with thousands of people. And, you know, um, and the only thing stopping her was her belief, actually. Mm -hmm. She had a lot of the, um, you know, the IP hasn't changed, her coaching skills. And, you know, and so now she has the frameworks in place to grow that internationally. And I, I think it's just um, coincidence that it's similar in terms of walking and running, yeah, yeah. but there are other examples in the community just that, the slower you know, version. just the slower version. Yeah. Um, but you know, there are other people that work in um, all sorts of fields, you know, real mission led businesses. Right. Um, That's really good to hear. So let me ask you um, a, a few questions around that then. You, you said that she had it all in place, but there was just something missing. What was the thing she had to get in order to, to go to scale? I think it's vision and belief and not wanting to do it by yourself right. because I think with any business, but particularly online businesses, all it is, it's not difficult. It's just a million decisions every day. I mean, that's what running an online business is. Should I do this or should I do that? Should I do this? There's not one way to run a successful business. And so when you're doing it by yourself, you're having to make all of those decisions day in, day out. And we get decision fatigue. When, you, when you're part of a mastermind or a coaching program where people know you over time, um, you know, you'll go to launch something and everyone will go, something feels off. Mm. I think there's a better way to do this. And when you've got four or five people saying that, you can put the brakes on it. You know, and, but when you're doing it by yourself, you know, late one night, you might launch something. It takes you completely off path, you know, because you've only got yourself and you can get caught up in your ego and all of that. So there's something around a collaborative approach to business coaching. So I describe TriBuilder as an incubator. And actually, I'm not the only coach on the program. We all support each other. And the motto is nobody's left behind. So, you know, it's all about how can we support each other? We, it's not cookie cutter no one's doing the same thing in their business it's all very different um but we're learning from each other all of the time about what might work what we might want to explore we use pilot we pilot everything nothing is ever set in stone it's always with should we just give this a go you know and if it fails we will enjoy it as a failure and we will learn from it and we won't do it again yeah yeah that's really really great to hear and, and all of the people in that community are doing something like you in, in as much as it's about impact and income right yeah but it depends on where they're at in their journey some people come into tribe builder and they're brand new to business right so sometimes they'll get a life coach who is absolutely mm. just out of training and they know they want to build a tribe but they have no idea mm. and so some of what i teach is tactical some is you know do do i set up a um a facebook group or not right? And there's not a one answer to that. It depends. And so I have a tool called the tribe leader archetype tool. So we go through that to see what kind of tribe leader are you? Are you um, the mother? Do you want to hold people to your bosom and look after them? Or are you the creator? Do you want to create stuff over and over again and quickly get it out there? Like mm. there's different energies to tribe leaders. And once you know your energy, it makes it easier to build a tribe around you without it feeling out of alignment. Some people hate running a Facebook group. I love running Facebook groups, but not a free one. I don't have a free Facebook group because okay. I don't enjoy the energy of that. I want people mm. that are going to do the work that I can hold to account. I love running communities. Um, 
but I am not going to run a free community because that just doesn't feel strategically aligned to me at the mm. moment. But yeah. for, some, for some other people, it's a brilliant business tool. It's a business, uh, a great business strategy. So it really does depend on um, the type of entrepreneur that comes in and it is really diverse. We can have people that have been in the game for 20 years and they've just got a little bit tired. And I don't mean that in a, in a rude way, yeah. um, you know, okay, or so somebody that's ch changed niche, you know, somebody mm. might be really good at what they do, but they've changed their focus. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly getting tired is easily done as an entrepreneur, isn't it? There's a point where you suddenly hit a wall. To go back to the running uh, analogy, you hit the wall and it's hard to break through sometimes until, you, yeah. until something changes for you. Um, so the reason why I asked about, are they all roughly in the same field of impact and income is I'm just curious, what, what are some of the, the big, broad lessons you've been able to kind of take away from watching these various people do things and go, ah, this is, if you really want to make a social impact, but be commercially successful too, here are some of the sort of main planks. I wonder whether yeah. there's stuff there. I think it's about sharing your vision. So even if you, um, and, and some of my, some of my clients, cause we look at vision and mission right at the start and some of them go, I don't have a mission. I just want to sell coaching or I just want to do this. or I just want to do that. So I have a lady that's a book coach and she's like, I don't have a mission. I just want to sell coaching to people that want to uh, write books. And when we looked at that, I was like, what type of people do you want to work with? And she was like, I guess people like you, you know, people that are running coaching business that, you know, and what it transpired is that she wants to support visionaries. And so if she helps visionaries get their books created, she will have massive impact on this planet, you know, and once she'd made that connection, she was able to say, actually, my model is not serving me. So she was doing a lot of one-to-one -one coaching, but she couldn't really see how the one-to-many model could work for her and we created something called right now which is a, a weekly accountability uh, group where you pay 30 pound a month and three times a week you can go in and write your book so it's accountability and what was really interesting when we did that and it's like the bottom part of the rug for her you know it's like you know she will work with x amount of people and some of those people will go on to work for her as a coach right but it also generates a really good amount of money from her uh, for her and I can remember her saying oh god I feel really uncomfortable with taking people's money because I'm not coaching them you know I'm not actually giving my expertise and I said what's the number one problem with people writing books they just never get around to it so actually you are providing a service you are holding space for people and keeping them accountable I mean I get up every Wednesday at 6 a.m to write with her there's mm. no way I'd get up at that time on a Wednesday otherwise you know, and I pay my money like everybody else. And so sometimes it's about allowing your model to change slightly to get to the bigger picture. And I think coaching one-to-one -one can be great if you want to go really deep. But I think there's also this belief that you can't go deep with group coaching. And I think right. you absolutely can. You can make enormous shifts from a tiny question, you know, or a tiny prompt or mm. by telling a story. Um, and, and so for me, I'm really interested in different ways of, of scaling up um, that fit with the objectives of that person. Mm. I, really, I was really taken by that phrase you used, which of course, you know, classic Marine phrase, but you know, leaving nobody behind. And, and I wonder how you do that. Like to me, that feels it's, it's something I aspire to for sure. But you also know yeah. that given a certain volume of people, you start to lose track of who's where. So you don't even yeah. know you've left them behind, but it's happened. And I'm, I'm curious on your take on how do you do that? How do you keep people with you? Yeah. I think there's this belief that we only have capacity for a certain um, number of relationships. And there's definitely evidence that says that. There's, um, God, I can't think of the name, but there's this, uh, I can't remember, it's gone out of my head. But there's this thing that the Romans used to have armies of 150. And I can't remember what the saying is, but you know, 150 is supposed to be the correct uh, community size for people to know each other and all of that and I do buy into that my group programs that have less than 100 feel different to the ones that have more but I think given any um, group of people you always have kind of the outliers the people that jump ahead the people that get it the people that are mm. visionaries that want to make stuff happen and then you have the people that are trailing behind that drop out and stuff like that and actually all you need to do is manage those two sets of people and then you have more kind of cohesiveness mm. so because of the nobody left behind uh, kind of analogy in the running world um, and so many running clubs don't do this so the people at the front of the pack want to run faster and further right 
the people at the back want to run less and slower. And actually what tends to happen in a running club is the fast people go off, you don't see them for dust, and the back, people at the back feel really bad because they're slow. And actually in an ideal world, what you'd get is the fast people to loop back, say hi to those guys, and in the end, they'd run further and faster and everyone would be happy. Oh. But so many running clubs don't do that. And so I think part of the trick is encouraging the people that are flying to also feel responsible for the people coming up the back yeah. and to give them opportunities and to support them and to nurture and to mentor. Um, and it's about, as a coach, checking in with both sets of those people and making sure people in the middle are relatively happy too. Mm. Let me ask you this then, because, because uh, to build on that, when you start asking those people to, to support the slower ones or whatever they might be, whatever the adjective becomes, are you are you doing that? Are they doing that out of the goodness of the heart? Are you building a kind of altruistic approach to it? Or like, how, and how do you how do you call upon people yeah. without expecting too much? Yeah, um, that is my utopian view of how we should work, right? Mm. But I know not everyone is like that. Um, in my messaging and in my marketing, I talk about the tribe mentality and nobody left behind and mm. you know imagine a world where you could call upon people and all of those kind of things um when people don't feel aligned to that what they tend to do is phone me up and say i don't want to do tribe builder can i just have you one-to-one -one? Mm. and they have to pay handsomely for that <laughs> and i'm happy to work yeah. with people like that um so i think that when people join tribe builder they know what they're in for they mm. know that they, those are my that's my vision um yeah. yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense actually building the building the the philosophy from the outset so they know what they're getting yeah that makes so much sense um i'm, I'm, I'm sort of coming towards the end of our conversation at the moment julie but uh, but i'd love to get some if i may some sweeping lessons and maybe you've already said them but let's crystallize them so imagine you're watching this video and you're thinking i want to make a social impact but i also want to build it in as a commercial you know i want to have a commercial part of it's so I'm in control of my destiny. I'm not reliant on funding, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. What would be some of your, like the, the, the biggest key kind of lessons or biggest key steps you'd say, yeah. start here, go here. Yeah. I think the very first thing is really nailing your niche, right? Really saying, this is who I am. This is who I stand for. And a lot of people that teach niche in, it's all about, I do X to help X to mm. do X, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I really truly believe your niche is you, right? Mm. I really feel that it's about who you are, your skills, your expertise, who you decide to work with mm -hmm. um, and what your vision is. And if you talk about that consistently for six months, your business cannot help but grow. Mm. And what tends to happen is people don't do that. They're really kind of wishy-washy about who they are, who they serve. They'll work with anyone. Anyone that's got money, they'll work with, right? Um, and and there's no coherence to the way they talk about themselves. Mm. Um, so I always say, you know, you need to be able to articulate what you do in a similar way to someone you've just met down the pub and somebody you're speaking on a podcast with. Yes, you would describe it in, in different ways. You'd use different words, but they both need to be able to get it. Like sometimes people have, you know, LinkedIn headlines where you read it and you're like, I'm still not sure what you do mm. because we use industry words or words that our clients just don't use. And I just think if we can dumb down our messaging and talk in real terms, how do we help people? Why do we do what we do? You know, how, how do we want to describe ourselves? Um, and it always starts with us. You know that we have even if we're new to a, a niche or new to a, a business we're not new to life and so we should be bringing everything that yeah. we've ever done to the table yes we have to tweak it and put it un under an umbrella in some way um but once you've done that you can relax and i think that's been the biggest thing for me this year i did a big piece of branding work um at the back end of last year and the start of this year and i've started using that umbrella term of being a community engagement strategist it feels like a weight has been lifted off my shoulder mm. because I can now just go about doing all the various things that I do, knowing that this is how I'm going to be describing myself for the next two to three years. This is what I've done all my life. 25 years I've been doing community engagement. So it's not like, oh, this is not what she was doing before. People can join up the dots. Like, yeah. and, and so many of us are like multi-passionate and we do different things in our lifetime. And sometimes people can't keep up and we can't refer 
people to people that we don't understand what they do mm. so i think niche is everything but it really does start with you it's not it's not your tagline it's not your linkedin header it's who you are what you do and why you do it mm. And then once you've got that, and, and, and we won't go too deep into this because, because you, I could keep questioning you forever, but I'm just curious, <laughs> once you've got that sense of who you are and what you want to do, if you're an ingenue and you're just like, I, I haven't got a clue what to do, what would you say is your first one or two steps yeah. once you know who you are? I think it's doing the work, right? So it's chicken and egg. I can't, I can't work with the clients because I can't find them because no one will pay me because I don't have enough expertise, don't have enough experience, right? And so that keeps us trapped. And so what we tend to do is slowly, slowly um, find people that friends that we can coach and all of this kind of stuff. And I remember at the start of my plus size fitness business, when I was thinking about turning it into a business, I was like, I've got no credibility here. Like I'm a plus size runner and I've got a lot of experience, but I've never coached anyone else mm. with running. And so I went onto Twitter and I had this idea for a project called the Fatty Must Run Marathon Challenge, right? Because that was my hashtag on, on um, Twitter. And I found 16 women who were willing to be coached for free for a year. And the challenge was, could I get the marathon ready in a year? Mm. And I did that for free over and above everything else I was doing. And what it did was it taught me how to coach. It showed that I could do it. I got feedback from those women. I got testimonials. I was able to talk about it when I got interviewed in the press. It was something interesting and it was the work. Yeah. You know, it was the work of the business. And so many of us go into business to do something we're passionate about and then spend most of our time learning how to market and learning how to oh. do all of that stuff. So it's do the work by any means necessary. You know, do the work of the work. Yeah, I love that. I love that. It's such, such good advice. Just because then you start to believe in yourself. Yeah. And it's like, well, who am I not to do that work ultimately? Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Thank you. Um, is there anything that you'd like to, to share, Julie, that I haven't asked you about? Because obviously I've asked the questions, but maybe there's something yeah. you wanted to share, some, some yeah. wisdom or experience that you think might be useful to kind of get out there. I think there's something around just deciding. So at the beginning of this year, I just decided I was going to have a great year. Mm. Right. I just was like, this is going to be the year that, you know, I had been under earning the last few years because I've been reinvesting the money back into the growth of my business and all of that and I just said no more like this is the year that I create real wealth out of my business and stop being like apologetic about you know my abilities and then of course COVID hit and I was like oh god typical you know now I've got a seven-year-old at home all the time you know all of this kind of stuff no one's got any money and that lasted for three days I allowed myself to wallow for three <laughs> days and then I went back to my vision from the start of the year and I said what's changed and actually nothing had changed mm. other than the childcare stuff, which was hard. Nothing else had changed. People still needed what I need, what I do, and they needed it more than ever. Mm. And so I just decided that as long as I run my business ethically, there was still nothing wrong with me making a heap of money this year and a heap of uh, impact and a heap of progress in terms of where I want to get to in my, with my goals. Um, and I think by being honest, I was, I was so honest with my, with my community. I sent emails out saying like, you know, if you are going to be offended by, by me having to stop to give my daughter an ice lolly, then I'm not the coach for you and you should unsubscribe. I was really honest about the highs and lows of coaching during COVID. And I think if anything, my tribe pulled together and, you know, really supported me. I mean, I got care packages, I got offers of, of therapy, I got all sorts of things, little packages for my daughter, all because they knew I was juggling so many things mm. and trying to look after everybody, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think there's this thing about deciding. I'm deciding to be successful. I'm deciding to grow my business um, and not letting too much of the external factors get in the way. Mm. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, last question. How do people find out more about you, Julie? So if they want to either work with you or check out your projects what's the way what's what's the way in the easiest way is just to, to google my name so julie crefield uh google that and what tends to come up first is the two fact to run because i've been doing that for 10 years um and then my other stuff comes just below that but it's quite a unique name so it's very easy to find my stuff um, and i'm all over social media that's wonderful julie thank you so much for joining me today it's been really really great talking to you